Signalia. Uh, those of you who are not familiar with this area of Spain, uh, we are very close to Santander uh, in Bilbao, so I just have a one hour ride uh, to get to here. And um, yeah, we are involved in the sale project as well in VPC. Uh, the title of this presentation is slight, slightly different from what was announced in the program, but the topic is, is the same. Uh, I guess uh, all of you have been listening to um, very uh, well-structured con concepts regarding networks, regarding internet, and uh, all related uh, stuff to connectivity, open connectiv connectivity services and all that. Uh, our topic is totally different. I mean, um, inside the open framework uh, within OCONS, um, this uh, work um, is um, focusing on what is called DTN, which is Delay or Disruption Tolerant Networking. And uh, I'm not sure that everyone knows anything about this, but I'll give a brief, very brief introduction to that. And you will see what I mean when I say it's totally different from infra infrastructure-based networks. It's uh, the opposite, I would say. But indeed, we can do things with this uh, um, paradigm, and we will show you that in a minute. Uh, okay, so we will introduce the concept, uh, some related work. There's uh, plenty of initiatives in this um, field. Uh, it's quite broad, uh, so I would present some different approaches, uh, the one we are following, okay? the motivation why we chose this direction, uh, the protocol we specified within the work in sale, uh, which is called HARRY, uh, the principles where we based our design and why, and some initial simulations and the first results of uh, just as a proof of concept and the remaining work we plan to do still this year within the project and also for the future. Okay, and some references. Um, okay, Technalia um, is not um, a very ancient uh, research center because it comes from a merger process. In the Basque Country, we uh, had before separate uh, smaller research centers, and from January 2000, 2011, uh, we became one altogether, which is called Technalia, okay? And uh, because of this merger process, we are now, um, I mean, we are uh, developing uh, collaborative um, initiatives among all of us, because before we were separate. Um, the work I'm presenting here belongs to this uh, bottom left part, the ICT European Software Institute Department of Technalia, and specifically to the telecom unit. Okay? Uh, but as you can see, uh, inside Technalia now, it's a, a quite a big uh, company with uh, more than 1,500 uh, colleagues working, so it's uh, quite uh, bigger than before. Uh, that this telecom unit I belong to uh, was before part of um, a smaller center with two, 200 people, more or less, so now we are bigger <laughs> and we are getting used to that as well. This was just to, to present, uh, uh, I mean, where I come from, okay? And also I would like to say in this work, uh, not only me, who uh, is presenting now this uh, here in front of you, but also Nayara, which is attending the, the whole week this summer school, uh, has been uh, working uh, in all of, of this protocol we are presenting now. Okay, to start with, uh, I'm not sure many of you may be familiar with opportunistic networking, dynamics, uh, mobility, I don't know, in different forms and names. Um, the paradigm behind disruption tolerant networking um, is a, a design, a network design uh, that um, smooths 
the adverse impact of uh, temporary or intermittent communication on the network. So uh, up to now, we've been talking about the internet, about everyone and everything is connected to one single big network. In this case, we, we state the problem, just the opposite problem, I would say. We have uh, devices spread. We can think of this room, all of our mobile devices, okay? They are all connected to the internet, but they are not connected one another directly. And that would be, for example, a DTN, where uh, you have short range connections, so there is no available end-to-end -end path from each one to any other uh, of the network, but instead you have uh, temporary connections due to dynamics or mobility. Uh, if some group of us move out from this room, uh, you lost connection to the network, but tomorrow when you get together again here, you would gain again that access and you belong again to the DTN, you could exchange content things like that. So connections uh, are on, are active, or not available, depending on several things. We could say dynamics in a general sense, and specifically, we are focused on human mobility. I mean, the, we centered the topic on human-based networks, because that's uh, our main interest. But you can think of very different scenarios. I mean, this concept of DTN emerged first from the NASA uh, US agency because they talked about it interplanetary connections. Uh, when you have, for example, satellites um, and they don't have permanent direct links one another, but because they are orbiting temporarily and uh, expectedly, you know when they are going to see each other directly. So that would be also an intermittent connection. And you would think of um, delayed tolerant transmissions in such a way. So it, it's very uh, wide concept, I would say. And we are going to focus this on the human-based uh, networks. So we can think uh, of our mobile devices attached to a person for example, okay? Uh, as I was saying, uh, maybe you've heard of wireless challenge networks, mobile adult networks, opportunistic networking, even sensor networks. For example, some initiatives regarding um, the censoring or this, the deployment of sensor networks for monitoring wildlife in natural parks, for example, or for sensor detecting uh, environment measures, um, the communication paradigm behind can be constructed on a DTN basis. So, as I said, it's uh, many things related, and every each of, of uh, them has uh, its own particularities. Okay, uh, for us uh, people, I mean human-based mobility and dynamics in the network. That's the main thing for us. Okay, uh, there's one important thing. The third bullet in this slide says uh, the transfer or, of transmission custody to intermediate entities. What does this mean? As I said, if we are uh, thinking of a DTN, we don't have an end-to-end -end path permanent, permanently available. So in this room, if I base all communications in short range links, uh, if I want to transmit something to someone over there, I would need intermediate hopes to get there, okay? So if I want to share one photo on my, on my mobile phone, uh, I would address as a destination of my transmission, I don't know, whatever, someone next to the door, okay? But I cannot, I cannot deliver it directly because I don't have a connection. I don't even know if my destination is connected, is present here. So how would I deliver that photo? If I, what I can learn?
from the neighbors I have surrounding me. So that's uh, one of the approaches for routing in DTN. That um, everyone relies on one of their neighbor, neighbors, so I put in custody that photo of mine, and I say to one of my neighbors, take this, and when you get to see my destination, transmit this for me, please. So custody means that as we don't reach the destination directly, we rely on intermediate nodes and that they would transfer that when they have the opportunity. That's why the delay tolerance concept. Because this is not immediate. I'm, I'm not sure when my uh, transfer will be actually delivered. I'm not sure. So I allow some delay, unknown delay, and depending on the service or the application or the scenario, I can um, expect uh, different ranges of delays. I mean, for me, it can be enough for one day delay, but uh, in a satellite communication, maybe it's one week and that's okay. So it depends on the scenario and on the application, the range of delay we can expect. Okay, um, Okay. so the architecture involved is totally different to traditional, for example, TCP IP. It's more um, in a way that we construct uh, bundles, which is uh, clusters of information packets. Okay, so that's the upper layer. Um, and each bundle packet has uh, mainly those three parts, the source application data, some control information, how to handle, store and forward the packet. For example, we can take different approaches. We can say, uh, if we are not sure when the destination is going to be reached, maybe I, I can put two copies of the same bundle packet so that I have more probabilities that I uh, get the destination sooner. That's one option. Another option is uh, I know for sure that my destination is always connected to this neighbor of mine at 11 o'clock daily. So if it's 9 o'clock, I can decide, OK, I'll wait to until 11. So I put my packet to this neighbor, and I know for sure that he's going to see my destination. So depending on what we know previously from the topology or from the neighbors or from the people behind the mobile devices, we can take different decisions as well. And that's the interesting thing for us. We want to learn what we can know from the availability of those devices uh, if we study people's behavior. So we normally are ruled by patterns. Uh, all um, in a working environment, we normally get to work almost same hour every day. We normally get out same hour every day. I usually take always a coffee at 11 every day. I usually have lunch at two o'clock every day. I usually meet with the same people for lunch every day. So those kind of things uh, can provide information for the topology of the network, if we think of our mobile devices. Okay? And that's our main uh, focus here for this work. Okay, we have the bundle packet. Then we have routine layer, which is uh, similar to any other routine layer. Okay? But in this case, um, we can um, design on which parameters we want to base the routine. We can design, and this was our work with the Harvey protocol, um, how a DTN node would construct its routine table. How would a node decide to which neighbor should I deliver this packet headed to any other destination node? on which basis, right? And then behind the routine, 
we have a convergence layer. This is uh, specified in the DTM uh, architecture as uh, um, the abstraction of the physical connection. Okay? For example, in our case, uh, we performed experiments with, based on Bluetooth connections. So there is a convergence layer for Bluetooth so that you don't need to manage the Bluetooth um, a manager directly, you can uh, get an abstraction from there. And also now we, we are implementing on Android phones, so we are trying to use Wi-Fi physical connections, and for that we have a different convergence layer as well. Okay? So basically this is more or less the general basis of the architecture. Okay? Um, as I said, there is uh, very different uh, lines of work uh, regarding opportunistic networks, DDNs, and all that. Okay, I just uh, summarized here some of them. There are uh, many others, but uh, you have some reference there, and you can ask as well if you want or if you like. Uh, for example, um, there are some studies uh, focused on studying the human behavior itself, how we gather together, why. Uh, which unexpected events make us vary our decisions outside our normal patterns, for example. Uh, mobility traces of people around a building, around a city. Uh, so human behavior normally influences both the network design and also societal structures. Okay, so the more knowledge we get about uh, human patterns or behavior or social gathering or the reasons why we gather, the moments uh, we do it with whom, things like that, get, uh, get us to know information, valuable information for network design and also for the structure of society in, uh, as a generality. Okay? Uh, Eagle and Pentland, those references four and five there, uh, performed some um, real field uh, experiments uh, regarding proximity interactions. They used uh, uh, Bluetooth connections on mobile phones as well in a public um, uh, event, and they traced um, the mobility of people around the city. It was a large crowd event as well, and they studied the database of contacts uh, coming from that. They performed then offline uh, analysis on um, social graphs. I mean, uh, from the connection patterns of groups and people, they tried to derive social graphs related to people involved in the large crowd. Uh, if you know how people get together uh, in a statistical basis, for example, you could derive or you could estimate uh, connections in a DTN. I, as I was saying before, if I always have lunch with three of my of my colleagues at two o'clock, uh, sorry, at two o'clock every day, that would be very useful to estimate when I am seeing this specific node every day at two o'clock. So, if we know the reasons and the causes that make us get together at one hour in a common pattern, that would be useful for routine as well, if we think the other way around. Okay? Um, Profit, uh, it's uh, the most, uh, I would say, the most uh, known routine protocol for DTN. It's uh, based on probabilistic routine, which means uh, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure that I will see this node, okay? I'm not sure the example I was using that Susanna gets uh, to, the, um, to the canteen every day at two o'clock with this and this. That's not sure. But I base that on estimation, on probabilities. And what does Prophet use to estimate that probability? The history of encounters of nodes. A node, um, Learn, learns these probabilities from uh, each of the encounters with its neighbors. If I meet this neighbor uh, now, today, 
we get we separate so we lose connection and in two hours we meet again I have some information because I know I have seen the same note two hours before that intercontact time the frequency of our contacts together if you store that information for some time you can train the node to learn that with uh, more frequent encounters you could derive that your probability to see that node again it's higher if your encounters are getting more sparse in time you could derive that there's less probability that you will see that node so basically profit uses that concept. Bases the, prob the probability of seeing a contact on the history of frequency contacts um, stored by the node. Okay? Uh, and then we have works, for example, like uh, Professor Varvasi, uh, which applies the study of human dynamics to many different fields, uh, from the study of uh, the spread of cancer cells uh, to uh, networks as well, to the um, uh, extension of how uh, groups of business colleagues uh, get in contact with one another, for example, using social networks. So, um, Varavasi combines many different concepts from very different fields on this uh, social uh, connection basis, okay? And also tries to derive patterns from mobility and from contact of human uh, beings, okay? Uh, with this uh, introduction, we thought that uh, we liked the approach taken by Prophet, for example, for routine, because we believe in uh, the concept that uh, human uh, behavior follows patterns, so we, we would like to study that um, more precisely, okay? So we performed on our own experiments in our premises. We designed ad hoc Bluetooth devices. These were not mobile phones. This was an uh, ad hoc device just uh, designed for this to trace contacts, short range contact, uh, and very, uh, with a very high precision. Uh, we detected contacts every five seconds. So we checked new connectivities every five uh, seconds, okay? This is just, uh, I mean, a, a picture uh, representing a building, uh, uh, sorry, an office building, okay? So th those are uh, typical uh, work tables, uh, the receptionist, uh, where's the meeting room, uh, where's the kitchen where people get together to have a coffee or to have lunch, things like that. Okay? Our building has two floors. Uh, we performed this experiment with 56 colleagues wearing this device uh, all day during working hours. We had also 30 fixed beacons. So for example, we know when someone is alone in the kitchen, because in the kitchen we have a beacon as well, so we can trace also uh, mobility. And uh, this lasted for uh, six weeks, so we got an output of a huge contact dat database, uh, very, very huge. We started uh, working on this uh, outcome, uh, trying to analyze um, the pattern of the intercontact times uh, between pairs of people, for example, and also for um, studying the dis mathematical distribution of durations. And the contact duration is something uh, that Prophet didn't look at at all, but we thought that the duration also influences, for example, the possibility of transmitting a bundle packet, depending on uh, the bandwidth of your physical connection and also the, the size of the bucket, okay? But if you think of a photo, as I said before, you need quite a long time for Bluetooth. So the duration, we thought that was a, a key parameter as well to make this profiling, right, among neighbor nodes. Um, 
uh, you have the reference of this Bluetooth experiment in our premises. Um, we performed the analysis of cumulative distribution functions of, as I said, the intercontact times and contact durations among nodes, and we came with uh, non-conclusive ideas at all, which means we followed a very strict method by reference number 11, which you have at the end, which basically um, was a mathematical strict method to derive with uh, an input of uh, data, uh, I mean, in our case, into contact times or contact durations, a uh, huge input of that. Um, you apply a, a mathematical method, there was three steps to derive if those data followed a power law distribution. Why a power law? Because some previous studies, for example, the experiment by Eagle and Pentland, I, I was uh, saying before, uh, thought that uh, the intercontact times could be assumed to follow a power law distribution. But that is not so clear from our experience. Why? Because it influences a lot, a lot, the time precision you use. So if you use minutes for the same pair of notes or seconds, the result is totally different. It's not conclusive at all. And it also depends uh, on how you aggregate uh, the exact values on time intervals. If you use, for example, if you say, okay, durations of five minutes and six minutes, I would take always five. Or between, I don't know, one day and one day and one hour, I would take one day. So depending on how you aggregate those kind of values, I mean, your time interval, and the, the precision you are allowed to, to expect, the result is very different. To illustrate that, yeah, I know it's very small, but you have it on your um, presentations. This graph uh, would be a CDF graphical estimation for the, um, uh, I think it's intercontact time. Um, um, yeah, I mean, uh, that would be probability of uh, having an intercontact time value of one of the x-axis values, right? Uh, this, as a graphical estimation, would be seen as a linear power law. And the x uh, axis here is uh, minutes. The time unit used here is minutes between a pair of nodes, okay, for intercontact times. This is the same graph taking seconds. So as you can see, the, the, um, um, the results of the mathematical strict methods are not conclusive in this case. Why is that? Because we think that depends a lot, a lot, on the deployment you study. It's very different an indoor analysis of human contacts or outdoor. It's very different working hours or free um, time. It's, I mean, you need to adjust um, to a specific scenario. So it's very difficult to have a pre-learned uh, knowledge of the behavior of a group, unless you know for sure that I go for lunch every day at two, okay? But if that's not the case, it's not fair to assume always power law distributions for those times, okay? So how we could come with a more meaningful estimation for those probabilities? Taking that one node can, can have the intercontact time with any other neighbor and the contact duration, the history of those values, right? Okay, so we wanted to uh, improve a little bit this profit approach. Uh, we wanted to derive a mathematical relation for the node to estimate uh, the probability of seeing, again, a neighbor based on this history of contacts but in a more elaborated uh, or meaningful way for us, okay? 
we based all of our design on the profit basis, but we changed many of the uh, calculations. Okay, as I will explain in a minute. And uh, we specified the components for this routine protocol. Uh, we incorporated this optimized profiling, uh, and then we tried to validate at, at least the functionality and performance of the solution. Uh, in, in some scenarios, I will explain uh, later on. This picture comes from the Ocon's approach uh, we had presented this morning. Uh, from this scenario, we would uh, focus on the wireless challenge network part. As you can see, we understand that no, no, not every node of the wireless challenge network would gain access again to the rest of the uh, domain data centers, networks, or whatever. But at least we can assume that some nodes would have both connections available. I can have 3G on my mobile phone and then have a um, a DTM basis connection with different other colleagues. Okay, so that would be the scenario where we are focusing. And regarding the architecture, more or less, this would be the case. Uh, in this kind of networks, every node is the same. I mean, we don't have different hi hierarchical entities, so we would have the three main elements implemented in every node. We would have information elements, decision elements, and enforcement elements. Okay, first, um, the information elements exchange their estimation of probabilities. For example, if I have three neighbors and I meet uh, a new one, I, I will inform this new neighbor about my probabilities of seeing these three. Just in case the new neighbor doesn't know anything about them because they never met before. So I will let him know I can reach A, B, and C with these probabilities, just in case you don't know them. If the new neighbor doesn't know A, B, or C, he can store in its routine table, okay, to see A, I will meet Susanna. To see B, I will meet Susanna. Okay, so it's uh, not only a self-learning process, but uh, nodes share their probability estimations, okay? so that they can know uh, who expects to meet with whom. Okay? That would be the first step. Then the decision element in this case would be, in each node, the process of uh, constructing the routing table. I can have more than one available connection to meet Nayara, for example, okay? Because, uh, I don't know, I met directly uh, Nayara and I have my own estimation because our history of contacts, but then I meet Ramon and Ramon has a different probability estimation of seeing Nayara directly, so Ramon tells me, my probability of seeing Nayara is this. I check that with my own, and I choose the best. So the thing is, uh, my decision comes from my own estimation of probabilities and what we call transitivity probabilities, which is estimations learned via other neighbors. Okay, So that would be. And then we have the enforcement element, which is when I really have something to deliver to Nayara, I need to establish the connection when I actually meet her. Maybe I'm not connected now, but if I get close to her, my Bluetooth or whatever, establish a physical connection, I detect that I have that connection available and I should actually deliver my information. So that would be more or less the case, all nodes the same, and this would be uh, the architecture sketch of this uh, approach. Okay, so here more or less is the same I was saying with the picture, the self-estimation process in each node, the context learning, when I learn different probability estimations from my neighbors, I need to decide 
which is best for me. Uh, and then with the enforcement element, we can uh, take different approaches. This is the part where we have worked uh, less yet. Why? Because by default, we uh, deliver one copy. We are not using more than one copy, but we still get uh, the packet in our own memory, just in case I see the destination again, for example. Uh, in the case between Nayara Ramon and me, I have a photo for Nayara. My probability of seeing Nayara is whatever value, okay? But I see Ramon first. So I can do two different things. Because my probability of seeing Nayara is higher than Ramon's probability of seeing Nayara, I can decide to keep the packet. I don't give it to Ramon, because I expect to see Nayara first, before him at least. Or I can say, OK, I expect to see Nayara directly. But as I have Ramon here, I can give the packet to him just in case he sees Nayara. So for the forwarding policy, there are many different possibilities as well. That's the part where we still have much work to do. Okay? We, we, we have uh, more or less all clear for the first part. But then again, we have lots of possibilities in the second part. Okay. This is more or less the whole process for a node. Uh, no, it's uh, more or less general. I have more details in the following slides. Uh, I don't know, Ramon, uh, get notice about my time. Okay. So this is more or less the process for a single node. We detect a node detects a new connection, for example, neighbor B. Uh, first thing, I need to update my direct probability with him. What does it mean? When I get a new encounter, I have new values because I have a new intercontact time. I was not seeing B and now I see him. So I have a last value of intercontact time. I will need to update that. I will, we will see how in a minute. Uh, then we need to evaluate our probabilities to any other node, which is K in this case. So A and B exchange their estimations to any other node they know, K, and A and B decide if they want to use the transitivity value or they keep the one they had before. So this is um, another process. We will see also in more detail in a minute. Uh, then. Um, once A and B uh, are updated, they check if simultaneously they have other neighbors connected. If I am node A, I meet B, we exchange information together, but I also have directly a neighbor C. So I need to update C about what I've learned from B and all that, okay? So that would be send updated PAK, yeah? Question. How do you proceed at the beginning? How do you start that system? Uh, we will see that in a minute because we start with a initialization value. When we, you first met, nothing, nothing. you have nothing. Yeah. So first time, first encounter, you have nothing. So you start with a default value for your probability. That's the same as uh, in profit, for example. When you don't know anything, because, because it's the first time you see that node, you assume a default uh, probability value. That can be configurable as well. You can start, I don't know, 0 0.5 if you want, or 0 0.3, 0 0.7. That's configurable. That's your default value, because you don't know anything about the other. Okay. Okay, once you have updated all these uh, estimation probabilities, if you have messages, if you have bundle packets, information packets to send, and you have destinations among your neighbors, you send them. You exchange those messages. If there is a dis disconnection, again, you will need to update your uh, direct probability with B, because you have a new value for contact duration. 
this is your last contact and there is a new duration for you. This is the main uh, sketch of steps. Okay, we are going now in more detail with two of them, which are the most, um, let's say, uh, novel from the profit perspective. Okay, which is the direct probability estimation, the update PAV, and the evaluation of PAK. Okay, the evaluation with other neighbors. Uh, how do we start? A node uh, knows from its contacts, contact durations, and in the contact times. But how do we use that? We need one single value. Or well, that's our proposal. Okay? We don't want to have uh, a long history of values. What do we do with that? So we started deriving a formula for the node to find a representative mean value of all those historical values. How do we do that? For that, we used our, the traces of a real experiment. Okay, we saw that, uh, well, you can look at, at such a huge database in many different ways, okay? But one of the things we learned was that uh, although not, um, although the conclusion of power law was not um, always true, you could assume that the more meaningful approach was to de derive his histograms for those values. Why? Because you can expect that um, bef uh, between two nodes, the most repeated value is the one you can expect to be next, or more or less. So how do we do that? without using uh, huge memory on the node. So we became with this uh, formula, which is quite good for us. Um, if uh, we think of this estimation both for intercontact or contact duration times, uh, it's the same estimation process, okay? Um, N is discrete in time, instance, so from the beginning of our history, from the start of the node until the current time, we will uh, perform a weighted mean value, which is basically this second summation here, uh, with the slightly differences. We don't use the exact value. We use time intervals, predefined time intervals. For example, um, from our experiment in our working building, we could derive uh, meaningful intervals for intercontact times between people and contact durations. For example, uh, people normally working in the same table for hours with a colleague next to them uh, those contacts were quite long, but otherwise contacts are very short because people stand up and go to the toilet, then go back, then go for a coffee, then go back. So those mobility um, derived contacts are normally very, very short. So um, for short range of durations, you need very precise intervals, because you want to distinguish very precisely. But above one um, range, maybe you don't need to distinguish between one hour and one hour and 10 seconds, because for you, that's uh, a one hour duration. So we came up with this idea that we could predefine uh, time intervals but not necessarily in a linear basis. So the size of these intervals, the precision used, depends on the range. Uh, that it's configurable as well. We used uh, this approach, I mean, smaller intervals for small range, and uh, 
not so precise intervals for higher range of values. Okay? So when I get a contact with Nayara, uh, maybe the exact duration is, I don't know, 33 seconds. But the value I get is 30, because it's the interval I'm considering. Okay? So that's the first thing. The discretizing of the exact values a node is storing. Okay? That values would be small v. Okay? And the highest time interval you define is the capital V okay? in the summation. And then uh, the E letter stands for encounters. Okay? So the small e is number of repetitions of the interval small v. The capital E on the uh, denominator is the total number of encounters, the total number of contacts a node registers, right? So it's a weighted uh, mean, but modified by the alpha parameter. What does alpha do? Uh, okay, uh, we think that this is uh, quite enough for a representative value, but what happens with uh, very old values? Maybe one week ago, because Nayara and I were working hand by hand in our office, my durations with her were very long, but now she's going to spend the week here in Santander, I'm going back to Bilbao. Why should I consider very old contacts for my estimation of a new contact? So alpha is a parameter that um, favors the more recent contacts and uh, defavors the old values. Okay? So in this summation, depending on the time instant um, of the specific value, we can um, increment its weight on the summation or decrement, okay, more or less. I know it's uh, quite detailed, okay, but uh, anyway, if you have any questions, uh, just raise, raise your hand. Okay, so more or less we try to perform histograms of uh, the values for contact durations and intercontact times in a discrete uh, way with these predefined time intervals and we try to favor the most recent values. That's the idea, okay? So, more or less, alpha preserves the statistical regularity of this type of networks because I'm wondering up to which extent you can ensure that your system is, is stationary or, or It's not. It's not. Uh, in fact, uh, in this kind of approaches, in the probabilistic routine approaches, you have also another concept which is called aging, where you can uh, end up with, uh, um, let's say, a time limit before uh, values are not considered anymore. So plus this alpha parameter we introduced, there is also an aging uh, algorithm that you can apply. So, I mean, uh, you don't consider values for one week ago, for example. So you can tune as well that... Yeah. Depending on the periodicity, you want to focus the pattern. That's important too. As I say, uh, in my examples, I'm using daily examples. I go to lunch every day at two. But what happens if I say, every Tuesday, I have breakfast with my mom? So for detecting that kind of pattern, you need one week uh, period. So this aging also depends on the period periodicity of the patterns you want to consider in the routine, more or less. It's related. Okay, okay. so now we can have a representative value of contact duration and intercontact time. How do we use it? 
how do we derive a probability value from those two parameters? Okay, so we tried to define that with this goodness formula. So um, the node tries to estimate how good is one neighbor, taking into account only those two parameters, the contact duration, I mean, this representative value of the history and all that, and the intercontact time. Okay, how do we do that? Uh, we started thinking about uh, the physical meaning of these parameters. Um, if we, uh, I don't have a pen here. Okay, if we draw a line, a timeline, um, the contact time and the intercontact time form a time period between a pair of nodes, right? So if this is uh, contact duration, this is intercontact time, here we need to have another contact time, otherwise this wouldn't be an intercontact time value. Understand that? So if we assume both parameters are normalized to the same uh, window size, we could define the frequency between two neighbors as the inverse value of uh, that sum summation, okay? Uh, and then we can think of um, if we only consider duration, how much time I am connected to one of my neighbors, uh, how could I rate how good is my neighbor? The more time I'm connected, uh, the better, right? Because I have more time to send packets. So the goodness in this case, if we only consider uh, T intra, I mean contact time, would be proportional to the time connected. That would be the goodness. My neighbor is better if I uh, remain connected more time because I have better connection. Okay. If we only consider the opposite, the frequency of contacts, the intercontact time, and this is a mistake, that's why I have it in red, not to forget that. Uh, this is uh, not true. Uh, between brackets, uh, you have in your presentations that T in the formula is intercontact time. That's wrong. In the formula, it, it is still intra. So that's a mistake if you want to take note. Uh, and I will explain that in a minute. If we only consider frequency, intercontact time, how could we, we evaluate the goodness of a neighbor? We only know the time we spend not connected, that intercontact time. So how do we evaluate that? The maximum delay we can expect in seeing that, that neighbor again is the inverse value of intercontact time. It's difficult because I don't have a pen, but if you think of the timeline, as I said before, the contact duration and the intercontact time are just uh, sequentially repeating, okay, in the same timeline. So the time we spend not connected would be T inter above the summation of T inter plus T intra, right? That would be the time not connected. So the maximum delay we can expect is the inverse value of that, because that's uh, in frequency, let's say. Okay? With the paper, you, I'm sure you can do it. <laughs> Don't worry. Or if I have one in a minute, I can uh, maybe explain better. So um, how we combine these two concepts? Um, that's why I said uh, in the formula there you see D inter, the inverse value of the delay, okay, delta. The T there, it refers still to the intra, I mean to the contact duration, because one minus FT is T inter. Maybe uh, if you draw the timeline, it's very easy, but maybe <laughs> looking at the, at the formula is not uh, so apparently easy, but it is. Uh, Ft is 
uh, the one before, is the frequency just multiplied by the duration. So it's the total duration in a periodically basis that you get one another, okay? So the maximum delay expected is one minus that time, one minus FT. And the inverse of the delay is that multiplied by the frequency again. Okay, uh, how do we combine this? And this is the last formula of this slide. Between nodes A and B, we thought that we could combine both Ft divided by 1 minus Ft, but you see a new parameter there, you see gamma. What does gamma do there, the same as alpha before? This is just for tuning which parameter do I want to prioritize. As you can see there, if you put gamma as 1, you would get the inter contact time approach. And if you use their gamma equal to zero, you would get, or send in to zero, you would get the first approach. So between gamma zero and one, you have all the intermediate balances between considering only duration or only frequency. Uh, this is easily as well seen if you use specific values. If you use, for example, uh, I don't know, uh, if you put numerical values into the formula, it's quite easily seen, okay? So gamma, it's uh, also a tuning parameter where we can choose to get more near to the profit approach, which only considered frequency, or to the total opposite approach, which is, which is only considered duration, okay? Or a hybrid approach. Okay, that's the main idea. And this goodness formula, oh, sorry, this was the explanation for gamma, okay? And this formula is used in the algorithm for updating or deriving direct probabilities between nodes A and B, okay? so. From this general process, we would be in the second box, okay? We detect a new connection, we want to update our direct probability with this neighbor, right? So we estimate the goodness of this neighbor because we have uh, the T values, the intercontact times, the contact durations, and we use this formula. And how do we... Uh, and how do we use that? If it's the first time we meet B, we used a default value, okay? P init, which can be initialized, I don't know, to 0 0.5 if you want. If not, if we already had a, a value for that direct probability, we estimate our goodness again between A and B, okay? And this is the final step. Shall we consider directly the new value estimated, the new goodness, or shall we consider the history of goodness values? That's a, the balance we kept in this last step. We do 50%, okay? So as you are updating uh, the goodness with its new contact, uh, maybe if the last value changes completely from your history, maybe you get very uh, large or variations of the estimation. So this 50% is just to keep a, smoothle, a smoothless uh, evolution of the, of the value, okay? So this would be how each of the nodes estimate direct probabilities. Okay, uh, just for uh, clarifying this thing with the frequency and time and all that, I was just saying if you draw between two nodes the sequence of their encounters, this is the first uh, encounter. They 
get together sometime. This would be T intra, and then they get disconnected. So here we would start our first inter contact time value, which would be whatever T inter. And when this is finished, it's because we have a new contact here. So again, we have here T intra. This is a new duration. That's why this is periodically, it's a sequence in a pair basis of nodes, okay? So this could be the period of your repetition, okay? That's why we define frequency as the inverse value of this summation, okay? Okay, what I was saying with the delay, if, if we want to consider we want to consider three nodes, this is A, B and C, what's the goodness between A and B, B and C and A and C? These two are not directly connected, okay? So A and B know each other, they follow this process, they get with a goodness value one another, okay? B and C get together as well, they get a goodness value one another, but A needs to learn a probability of C and C through node B. These two don't know each other directly. How is that performed? Okay, we use transitivity. How do we combine these two values here? Okay, so uh, Prophet uses a more uh, simpler combination law, which is just uh, incrementing or decrementing factor, okay? Plus the aging process, which is also present in our approach, okay? Uh, for us, as we use the goodness formula, it was uh, more meaningful um, to uh, apply a combination law based on the goodness formula as well. How do we do that? Um, if we only take, sorry, duration, um, this is contact duration between A and B, T1. And this is contact duration between B and C, <coughs> T2. What's the, wor the worst situation for A? How much time will A get? to send something to node C. The worst situation is a minimum value of these two, right? The minimum time. So if we only consider uh, contact duration, uh, the best chance for A would be the minimum value between T1 and T2. That's considering only duration. The opposite case, if we only consider frequency, Intercontact times, we have here delay one, delay two. How we combine uh, these two paths from A? Um, with the approach we were saying, the delay would be the inverse value of this. Why? In this timeline, we define the frequency as, as the inverse value of this period, okay? And we said, um, the time connected would be the intra duration above this sum, okay? That's our positive time. The time not connected, it's the opposite. 
the inter above the sum. Okay, so this above this or this above this. A long time, a long time, how much time these two are connected? F plus T intra, a long time, okay? I'm getting back to this, okay? That would be the goodness. Uh, if we only consider delay or the time not connected, which is T inter above T sum, a long time, how, do con how can we consider that? Again, if this is Ft, considering duration, would be this, a long time, the not connected would be 1 minus Ft. And the maximum delay would be the inverse of this. Okay, that's what we have there. F above. Uh, when we want to combine this with transitivity, what we can expect um, is the maximum delay between A and C is the maximum delay of the first hop plus the maximum delay of the second. So if we want to combine the goodness Sorry, it would be something like this. <laughs> so this would be the combination law because we have frequencies instead, okay, instead of time here. So the combination would be like resistors in parallel, okay? And again, how we use both combinations law, I mean the minimum, if we consider durations or this inverse combination if we consider frequency. Okay, so we use gamma again, and we come up with this formula. Uh, this is difficult to see, but I uh, will show you in a minute uh, an example. Um, with this formula, we have the combination law of the frequency, the intercontact time, but according to the lambda, uh, sorry, gamma parameter here. Okay, if you remember, with gamma equal to one, we have the case of considering frequency. With gamma zero, we have the case of considering duration. If you draw some values for this, and you put here gamma between 0 and 1 and you give uh, values for probability between A and B and probability between B and a third, okay? We are going to use 3 and 5, for example, okay? So, contact duration when gamma is 0 if we only consider duration, the minimum between three and five would be three, right? So this is three. And if we only consider intercontact times, we would need to do this, okay, which would be, this would be the combination, which is more or less something below 2, okay? So this would be gamma 0, this would be, uh, sorry, the extreme values, okay? Not with this axis. If you uh, draw this uh, combination uh, depending on gamma, you would get values like this. So we thought this would make a good balance between both extremes using again the gamma parameter, which for us is even more meaningful because the same parameter is used for the direct 
estimation of probabilities and also for the combination law of the transitivity probabilities. So for us, it, this um, represents that the significance in reality is uh, still remain, okay? Um, with this combination law, it's node A and B evaluate their probability values with third parties, okay? So B would inform node A about uh, its probabilities to other uh, neighbors, and A would inform node B about its probabilities with all neighbors, okay? Before um, applying this transitivity formula, uh, our nodes apply aging, okay? That was uh, regarding the question before. Uh, before you say to node B, okay, I know, know uh, I, my probability to, to reach node, I don't know, eight is this value. Before that, before informing um, about that value, you apply aging. Why? Because maybe uh, the timestamp of that value you have is, uh, I don't know, two days ago. Last, last time you updated that value is two days ago. So you need to apply some aging, which is a linear, uh, well, li between linear and exponential formula, depending on the time lap lapse since the last update, okay, more or less. So you apply the aging, you inform your neighbor about your probabilities to different nodes. Um, if you learn about node K for the first time, this is the diamond there, the question is, did you have a previous value for the probability to reach K? So if you, okay, here we did a yes in this arrow here on the left. Okay, if you had a previous value, you just go um, to the last box, you update your value. If you did not have a previous value, uh, this is the other way around. Um, uh, did you have a previous value? Ah, no, no, sorry, the question is the opposite. The value was null, that's why I was confused, sorry. Okay, if, if uh, the value you had for that node was null, that means you don't have a value. So if yes, you just take the new value. If it was not null, okay, so you had a previous value, you compare your previous value with the new one. Why? Because you want to keep the best value, okay? So if, the, if node B informs uh, to me about a probability to whatever, but my previous value was better, I don't keep B as an intermediate node, okay? That's uh, the thing. Okay, and there's another new thing, new uh, because Prophet didn't do this, uh, we added this detail because we thought it's uh, quite useful. We keep um, we keep track of which node provided me a transitivity value. For example, if I learn uh, how to get to Ramon via Nayara, I will never update Nayara about Ramon. It, this is just to avoid loops, okay? Because maybe um, this can happen, and in profit, indeed happened. So that's why we added this uh, detail here, okay? So we keep track of which node um, provided me with the value I keep in my routine table, just uh, not to corrupt that value with a loop, okay? Uh, sorry, I've been maybe too long. How much time do I get? 10 minutes? Perfect, okay. Uh, well, so just to prove all this design, uh, we, uh, I mean, 
we made some concept proofs with this uh, database of contact traces and all that, but we needed to um, show some, implement something, see how it worked, uh, things like that. And uh, we needed to define a meaningful scenario for this. So we wanted to compare uh, the performance of profit, which is the um, um, previous probabilistic approach, we were based on it. We want to compare that in the case that we had, for example, this kind of a scenario. Here we represent four nodes. It's quite simple. Um, the shaded positions are because of mobility, so mainly all nodes are mobile, okay? But here we represent those uh, movements who influence the connections, okay? So in this case, uh, as a generality, we have A, B, C, and D, and then we have another one over there. Node C could be the one, for example, gaining access to the outside world because uh, it has a 3D connection apart from being involved in the DDN and the rest of the nodes don't have uh, 3D access. So everyone wants to get node C to get to the outside world, okay? For example, and C is moving back and forth from position one to position two. Uh, in position two, um, C gets physical connection with D, okay, and with node A as well. Node B is also moving back and forth from positions one and two, but with a different pace, which means contacts between C and D and between C and A are short but very frequent because node C is quite fast, okay? But contacts between node B and A are not so frequent, but are quite long. What was the situation here? If node A needs to reach node C, because, I don't know, I want to upload a photo on the internet or whatever, I need node C, and my photo has quite a big size. So what's the problem? Prophet only considers frequency. So Prophet will always, always choose the direct connection between A and C. But the problem is that the duration of that contact is too short for the file to get transmitted. And that's why we um, designed this scenario with a longer path because A has a different available path through node C via B and then D and then again node C. And the duration of these contacts between A and B, it's quite longer than the direct path. So our Harry protocol would, depending on the gamma parameter, choose mm, more, mm, many more times the upper path than the direct path. So you get to deliver your information packets and with profit you don't get to that. We will uh, see some results now. Uh, okay, for this uh, simulation work, we used a simulator called the one simulator, which is specifically for opportunistic networks. And it, there is a DTN um, release available for this simulator, for the one. So we use that release, which includes uh, DTN, the bundle uh, layer, profit, and the commerce uh, layer as well. So we changed the profit layer, and we replaced that with our implementation, with Harry protocol, okay? And we compared both on this simulator. Um, okay, more or less this is the sequence. Node A creates eight information packets headed to node C, and C creates three packets headed to node A. So we have 11 packets uh, in the scenario, 
the bucket size is 50 megabytes, uh, transmission rate of Bluetooth, and we performed different gamma scenarios, okay? Remember, gamma zero was only duration. Gamma one was only frequency. And then we have the intermediate, okay? So we used, uh, for gamma, 0 0.05, the contact duration, 0 0.95, that would be the, the case more similar to profit because we only consider frequency. And then the intermediate, 0 0.5, okay? The balance between both. Uh, we predefined uh, intervals for the histogram uh, of contact duration times and uh, intercontact times. We performed this um, discretization with different granularity. So we will show results from poor granularity, I mean quite uh, large size in the time intervals, and with a high granularity. Okay, so uh, in high we are distinguishing uh, values of 0 0.5 time units, and with poor granularity uh, we don't distinguish durations below five time, time units, for instance, okay? So we will see different gammas and different granularity on the time intervals defined. First result we can derive is the convergence time in this topology of poor granularity is five, and in you improve your granularity, if you distinguish uh, more precisely the contact durations, you get up to eight packets delivered for the same gamma. Uh, and then, if we if we look at the last uh, with gamma near one, which is the more similar to profit, we still get three packets delivered. Why is that? Because um, related also to this improvement in the convergence, convergence time at the beginning. At the beginning, with Harry protocol, A learns about C first via the upper path. Then uh, it changes because we are prioritizing frequency. So uh, once we have uh, several con direct contacts with C, A would store the direct path as a better one. But at first, still we get up to three packets delivered before some direct contact, contacts with C have passed, okay? Then we have uh, probabilities um, from, no, from the node perspective A and B towards C, okay? The variation between the different scenarios. Uh, why we put here this comparison? Be because this would be the case where A needs to choose direct path or transitivity path. So the first row, PAC, would be the direct probability, okay? And the second row, PBC, would be the upper value of the probability that B would be informing to node A, okay? So in that comparison, whenever the direct probability it's a higher value, we will always choose direct path, which is the case of profit, always. And with Harry, we get different uh, results depending on gamma as well, okay, that uh, we can discuss. I won't go uh, in much detail with this. We also have here the last table when we compare specifically this probability values, direct and transitivity, with the different granularity, okay, which also affects the, the result, okay, but anyhow, um, we have some explanation of the results in this slide also that you can check. And just uh, for finalizing, um, we incorporated some more precise profiling for human related behavior uh, according to this history of contacts uh, among mobile nodes. We are uh, still working on this. Nowadays, well, Nayara has an implementation on real phones of our protocol, 
based on the Baitwala project. I'm not sure that well, you know this project. Uh, this is a, a open source implementation of the DTN architecture on Android phones. Uh, it's an available release on the website. I think I have included the reference as well. So we took that implementation and we uh, implemented our protocol in the routine layer instead of profit as well. Okay, so Nayara has an implementation, a running implementation on that. We are now um, deriving uh, a service on top where we can share, for example, a, a big file because by the while I intended only for short text messages and we want to show this problem with the short contacts. So we need like, a, I'm not sure yet, like a um, photo transmission or even a video service, something like that, very simple to show this uh, kind of scenarios here. We would also like to consider more parameters involved. Uh, you can think of, um, I don't know, saving batteries. You can think of incorporating uh, an index of popularity. Maybe I am a very popular um, node. I know many other neighbors in the network, so I can be one good intermediate node for any connection that you can get. So if you combine popularity with this probability estimation, maybe you can have different approaches. Uh, we would like to perform more, more uh, experimentation with these real Androids. And we would also like maybe to extend this hurry implementation to support this bundle protocol query, which has been developed also within SAIL. And this uh, allows the DTN nodes to act as intermediate caches of content. So this would uh, combine also the, the um, content-centric uh, approach, where, for example, if I ask for a specific photo uh, and my destination for that request is a video server, but my intermediate node already downloaded that file. So he can directly serve it to me instead of forwarding my request to the video server. So that would be more or less the, the functionality of PPQ included in, in the DTN release. So we would like to ex extend that as well and make some uh, tests um, prototype on this. You have the references named along the presentation here. Um, anyway, you have also my email address if you have any questions that you have.